Automotive advice with real world solutions to everyday automotive problems. The Under the Hood Show is heard weekly on this and other great radio stations across the U.S. Find out how you can participate in the show by visiting underthehoodshow.com. With Russ Evans, this is Shannon Nordstrom thanking you for tuning in to the Nordstrom's Under the Hood Show. Have a great day, and remember, PTLA. The opinions heard on this program, based on the many years of experience of Russ and Shannon, are offered for entertainment value only and as a guide to your repair needs. No claim to repair or cause is given or implied. Always consult with your own certified technician and follow all safety procedures before attempting any repair. To be a part of the show, call 866-594-4150. Under the Hood is produced by Prairie House Productions. All content is the property of Nordstrom's Automotive Incorporated and may not be used without our permission. Copyright Nordstrom's Automotive Inc. Now, let's go under the hood with the Nordstrom's Motor Medics. Welcome to the Under the Hood Show from the Autotempest.com studios. All the cars, one search. This is the Under the Hood Show. Russ Evans is here to answer your automotive questions. Welcome under the hood. Thanks for joining us. Shannon Nordstrom is here to do the same. Welcome, hoodies. Thanks for tuning in so we can help you tune up. I'm Chris Carter here to answer your calls at 866-594-4150. 866-594-4150. We've, we've all come in hot with stuff to talk about. We all came in going, oh, I have this news, I have that news. But we've already been getting calls as we're getting set up to start. So let's go to the calls, because that's what we're here to do. Let's talk to Dave. Dave, you're on the Under the Hood show. What can we do for you? Yes. uh, I talked to you before. I have a 2003 Lincoln Town Car, and the bottom gasket in the thermostat housing is leaking coolant real bad. I was wondering about how much you think that would cost to get that fixed. They're usually not too bad on that car. You got the four six in there, don't you? Yes. Yeah, depending on what shop you go to, they're going to average somewhere between probably a uh, hundred and two hundred bucks with the the parts and the the gasket and everything included in that. When you get into the newer cars that have the plastic housing on there, they can be two to three hundred dollars to replace it. Now. That car may have more of an issue than just. Yeah, isn't there an intake? Yeah, crossover piece in there that that right. Dorman resells. I know because there's yep. so many of them that do go bad. Yep, our partner Dorman Products sells a lot of those when that upper housing is more than that. When it's when it's the lower intake as well, you have to buy the whole part, and that's why they sell it because it's such a common issue. So on the low end, one to two hundred bucks if we're talking about a gasket and a thermostat and replacing that. You get up a little higher. Two to three hundred bucks if you've got one with a thermostat housing, but when you need to replace a whole intake, if they're telling you six to eight hundred dollars, that's a possibility because that would be the part, the labor, the antifreeze, you know, all that time involved. Have you got any quotes on it yet that surprised you? Okay, well, thank you very much. You bet. You bet. Uh, Thanks very much for the call. Good luck. I let's. Is there? Let me ask this. I'm trying to ask this sensitively while still being a car owner who doesn't trust anyone. Uh, yeah, great. Because I know, thank you. I know you guys. You, I mean, I know you wouldn't do this. Are there places where? Because we've talked about how there's always places. Go, I, we can just answer yes. Yeah, there's always yeah. places. You quote a job at ten hours, and if you're really good at it, you can do it in nine, and that's how you. Is there a chance? Are there places that they'll go? Well, it could be three to six hundred dollars, and then they. Get the job, and once they get in there, they realize it's the three hundred dollars, but they charge the six hundred. Yeah, I unfortunately see that okay more often than I should. I was just telling Shannon yesterday. I looked at a quote on something, and I said X amount of dollars to do that. And I said, you know, I just had to decode the VIN to get it a fact of how much that job takes, and knowing that job, it was quoted out. Now, when I dug into a little further, I said, oh, that's parts and labor. So. If I take the part out at full retail price and even just double it so it's like really high, it was still more than twice what the job should cost for this one sensor to be replaced by book time, which okay. book time says like 1.1 1. 1. 1 hours, you know, at the, at the hardest. But I know for a fact, this had some diagnosis included, so I know for a fact that I could do that job in 10 minutes. 
It's, I mean, it's just that easy. You, Chris, I could point at it and say, Chris, here's a wrench, change that, and it would take you 10 minutes. So there are jobs like that out there. Is it fair when a shop charges the hour that the book time says to charge when it only takes them 15 minutes because they spent, the technician himself spent $250 on a tool personally right. so that he could make it work and, you know, he takes some skin off his knuckles doing it because it's a hard job? Yes, that's that's what they do. That book time is an average. But what about the time when the shop spends three hours working on a job that they get paid an hour for because your car has right. a little more rust and things like that? And that's pretty common because I can tell you as a person running a shop and Shannon is a shop owner, at the end of every week, if I have three techs and they're there 50 hours a piece, I'm not billing 150 hours every mm-hmm. week. It's always lower than that. So that would be great if it was if it was true that most shops, and I would think we're, you know, an average shop, they should be getting way more hours than they're than they're actually there, right? If they're all doing that. So yeah, on the average they're they're down the low end. So the the point is trust the shop you're going to because you ask them questions. You know them personally. If you know them personally, they're less likely to, you know. Screw you. <laughs> uh, you know, you, you can trust them. You look them in the eye and they can say, yeah, it's going to take about this. We'll, we'll try to save you some money if we can. And there should be times where if you take your shop, th- your car there five times a year, there should be times where you go, oh, it's less than I expected. And other times where they might call you and say, it's going to be a little more. It's just the way shops go up and down. But overall, yeah, I, th- I think the majority, I'd say more than 90% of the shops are really honest and they're going to give you a great, price, Chris, but there are a few out there that they usually don't last very long. One of the things that the person keeps in mind on things like this, if you, if your last repair that you had done happened to be pre COVID, um, you know, and that was the last time you had a, a, a repair of significance done to a vehicle. And now you come in now and you want to get something done. A lot has changed a lot. And, right. and it's not just an auto repair. Right. Right. You name your category. A lot has changed. And so I think some people are still going through some of the sticker shock of parts prices increased, labor prices increased, um, you know, availability of when I can get something fixed increased, times, wait times. Uh, if you just you said, if, you, if your world hasn't had you in a position where you've had to do something of more significance in a repair, it, it's, it's different than it was three right. years ago. Yeah, it, if you've been waiting for an oven for two years... <laughs> It could be the same with your car. It's one of those where I can get you in and the part will be here in three weeks to two months, whereas you used to know it would be Thursday. Exactly. And Or else you just, you know, let's go to town this weekend and I think it's time to get a new refrigerator. <laughs> it can, it can kind of happen, but you mm-hmm. might be at the mercy of the refrigerators that happen to be available. Right, right. <laughs> We're going to take a break. When we come back, we want to hear from you on the Under the Hood Show.
Find out how you can participate in the show by visiting underthehoodshow.com. Eight six six five nine four four one five zero from the AutoTempest.com studios. All the cars, one search. This is the Under the Hood Show. What's caught your attention in the automotive world? Well, I tell you what. I just want to take a moment and just give some respect to someone that has been a caller to the show for a number of years. A powerhouse in the automotive world for yeah. us. Yeah, and somebody that really inspired us. But we got a note sent to us uh, a couple different ways. And so it was obviously quite important for people to make sure that we knew. And so we want to take the time to recognize the passing of Pat Reinhardt. And for those of you that are regulars to the show, you would know Pat as the 90-year-old wonderful woman that would call in with the Mustang GT. Mm -hmm. And for those that you don't know, have, are just picking up the show for the first time, Pat was this wonderful woman that called yeah. in with a 90 Mustang GT, and she just loved She's it. She's 90. Yeah. And she has a Mustang GT. It was a 2017, I believe, yeah. wasn't it? Uh, she replaced her Monte Carlo SS with yeah. this Mustang, Mustang GT, GT because she wanted a cool, fast car. I, I've got her, her. She loved it. I've got her obituary here that was sent to us um, by just a wonderful woman uh, that was uh, involved at the Hastings, Gene Hastings from Hastings Shoe and Repair uh, in Austin, Minnesota, and uh, she put some other neat comments in here, but. Uh, on the obituary, um, just as you go through it, uh, Patricia Ann Pat Reinhardt, age 90, of Austin, Minnesota, passed away Friday, December 17, 2021, at her residence. Pat was born October 17, 1931, at St. Olaf Hospital, Austin, Minnesota, the only child of Louis P. and Loretta E. Lamping Reinhardt. They grew up in Rose Creek, Minnesota, and attended St. Peter's Catholic Elementary School and Rose Creek High School, graduating the class of 1949. 1949. I did not know this. Russ may have. Immediately after graduation, Pat began, began a career as a secretary and office manager for several companies, including Shenander Auto Body Company, Robbins Company, and Smith Company, retiring in 1994. Her faith was the center of her life. She loved sports cars and always drove a classy car, right in the obituary. Uh, she is preceded in death by her parents, uh, Louis and Loretta Reinhardt's all members of the Joss P. Lamping family and many Reinhardt's family members. And so I just, when I read that, it just made me smile because right there in the obituary, she loved sports cars and always drove a classy yeah. car. And that, she would call cool. with questions like, how can I get more horsepower out of my GT? Yeah. I mean, it was things like that. <laughs> and also... The last call, I think, was, what are these buttons on the steering wheel? My yes. paddle shifters. How do I yeah, operate yeah. my paddle She didn't shifters. know about her paddle shifters, and she... The, she was yeah, curious the, about what that was and mm -hmm. why she had those notes, uh, those on her, on her uh, steering wheel. So, thank you to Jean for sending that in to us, and uh, peace to all the friends and family of. You can see if you're looking right now. I've got this nice little letter that was written um, to Pat, and she's been a friend of the show for a number of years, and so we uh, pass along our condolences and our sympathy. 866-594-4150. Now let's go to Kentucky and talk to Michael. You're on the Under the Hood Show. Michael, what can we do for you? Yes. Uh, so a buddy of mine, he's got a 2012 Ram 2500 with the 5.7 Hemi in it. And back in November, he had a lifter go down, and it uh, was picking intermittently. Um, it would come and go. Pulled the cam out, and sure enough, one of the lifter rollers had collapsed and ate into the cam. So we got that all fixed. Um, and due to weather and uh, sickness and everything, we just got it back together. Um, he drove it to work the other day. He put maybe 60 miles on it. He said it ran like a top. Went to go fire it up uh, at the end of the work day. And he said it would barely stay running. It was misfiring and running real rough. And he could it even die if you just let off the gas. We brought it back up, you know, brought it over, pulled the codes on it, and it has codes for the throttle pedal position sensor, like circuit A, B, C, and E. And um, but we also went through, you know, just because we had done so much work to it and tore it down and everything. I, mean, we, I went through and checked the basics. It's got, you know, really good compression. Um, we're getting fuel because it does run, but it looks like the spark plugs are white, like it's running real lean. Um, 
and the fuel pressure is at 60 psi. So I'm just, I, is there a way to test that without having special diagnostic software? Do we need to take it to a shop or, you know, uh, he's trying not to, you know, he's got four kids. He's trying not to spend too much money on this, but uh, at the same time, we don't want to just be throwing darts at it. position sensor, that throttle pedal position sensor, um, that is usually isolated to that circuit, which would be your pedal itself and the throttle body and the engine computer. Those are the three items there that, and the wiring, of course, in between, but those are the three items that are all wrapped up in that, that circuit. When we experience one in our own shop that has a throttle pedal position code, Almost every time for us, it has been the throttle pedal itself, the electronic pedal inside a little slot car rheostat built into it. The only one that I can think of that was not that turned out to be an engine computer that had failed, and we had to replace that and program it. So it's very possible and likely that one of the causes of your problems is that throttle pedal inside. Now, if you get codes for that, it can do all sorts of other things that affects the way the engine runs, you know, your idle speed. Um, it can make it run lean just because of the way it's trying to deliver fuel. It's not doing it uh, in, a, in the proper way. So that is one possibility. When you ask, can you do this at home without a bunch of equipment? If you're testing a throttle pedal or a throttle body, if you've got a scanner that can read codes and it does some basic data and it'll read accelerator position under APP and throttle position under TPS, then yes, you should be able to do some testing because you can get some charts off the internet and use just a plain old basic $20 multi-volt ohm meter to read the actual voltages at the pedal and that throttle body and compare it to the voltages you're seeing on your scan tool. Above that, if you need a computer, uh, you're, you're going to have to get it into a shop necessarily not so much the dealership, but an independent shop where they can retrieve the info out of your old computer, put the replacement used computer in. Um, Cardashpart.com is a place for that, a source for you. Then they put the computer back in, reload the VIN number, and then they can then they can put it in and use the used parts at home. One of the things I guess I'd like to bring up, and I'll just ask both of you, and this is just because we've been down this road enough times, with that vehicle that Hemi just having been a part, having a little bit of surgery done to it. It's got, what did you say, about 60 miles since you, since you had it apart with all that work? Yes. Is there anything, Russ, that putting it back together, if the plug-ins to the throttle body or a harness that got pinched somewhere all that, of it. that could affect and cause the same problem as if it's a failure of one of those parts? Definitely. If you've pinched anything in that, in that harness system up top or one of the grounds on the top of the engine is off, that could do that as well. So it might not be a bad idea before you think about too, too much testing just to retrace your steps on that entire wiring harness on top of the engine and also unplug where you go to your throttle valve and make sure that those spades are all straight and true and, and um, you know something's not, one's bent over to the side or something and shortened against another one. Now, you'd think that would cause you a problem immediately, but we've... We've been down this road. Um, when you do take apart something, you have you touch a lot of stuff. And so yep. the person's really got to put the pride aside and just say, okay, let's retrace our steps. Let's look at everything we did and just double check it. Uh, from anything that was touched or moved, go back and look at it again. And it's quite amazing the number of times, whether it's our pieces that we've done or it's a customer that has bought something from us and they're having a struggle with it after they just got it in. And sometimes the reaction is, is, Oh, this has got to be a bad item. And then we'll look back and say, you know, maybe it is bad. It could be, that's always a possibility. Our failure rate we know is pretty low, but it could be bad, but maybe a person needs to go back and just take a step back and look at all the pieces and say, could it possibly be something that you touched? Mm -hmm. And many times we, we get a call back and say, you know, we found that, the technician had accidentally uh, left this one plug-in not quite seated all the way, or 
the 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 harness had got laid against we've had it before laid against the crankshaft pulley and had a small piece rubbed through it or they don't call us back but our involvement <laughs> has gone away so we assume that they found <laughs> something but parts do fail i mean yeah. it, but I don't think the work that you did, I thought you were going to go a different direction with this call, that you are going to say that down the road, all of a sudden, this engine started having another internal problem. Because when you have that, yeah, cam, when you have that cam you issue, you, you, but, st- you start having that material get around inside the engine, and it can cause future issues if you don't get it flushed out real well. And it, something gets lodged somewhere, that can really be an issue. Is there any part of this that will drive him crazy if he puts it all, takes it all apart, puts it back together, and it doesn't? Fix it? Is it a That'll hard drive thing? To- every mechanic, whether you're a home mechanic or a professional, it's going to drive everybody crazy if you take it all apart and it still does the same thing and then you do it 10 more yeah, times. Yeah, but there's different still- levels. There's things I don't mind taking apart and trying to put back together, and then there's things that... M- Michael, we cut you off there. What were you going to say? One more thing? Yeah, one more thing is, so it, if, let's say, you know, we, I, you know I, I trace everything and I have thought about that I, and we uh, we did a little bit of that last night i mean i'm i'm gonna look at it again today but would that throttle position pedal cause it to is it out of the realm where or is it within the realm of possibility that it could be causing all kinds of rough idle the misfiring and you know obviously low power and all that or is it could it be too pot you know or am I looking at two separate issues? I think you have two separate issues. You probably have something else that's giving you the throttle pedal code because it's seeing some change in input there, but it's not seeing it at the throttle body. So it could be like Shannon said, it could be something even as simple as a wire on top of the engine that's causing that issue. That help you out okay. there, Michael? Sure does. Thank you so much. Thanks very much for the call. 866-594-4150. We're going to take a break. When we come back, we want to hear from you on the Under the Hood Show. The Under the Hood Show is brought to you by Sturdivant's.
Make a radio appointment each week to hear the Nordstrom's Under the Hood Show. 866-594-4150 from the Autotempest.com studios. All the cars, one search. This is the Under the Hood Show. If you join us on YouTube, if you subscribe to the feed and also join the Hoodie Fan Club at underthehoodshow.com, you could win a hoodie. Like Gene Clark, who listens to us in Yuma, Arizona. Congratulations from all of us under the hood and our friends over at Universal Technical Institute. My grandson's looking into Universal yeah. Technical Institute right now because he is thinking about becoming a mechanic and he sees what kind of money can be made out there in the in the trade. And he started looking around and I told him, I said, there's campuses all over the country. And he's like, oh, I didn't realize that that's cool and of course he's looking at one not too far away but he wants one in a in a cool area which always helps you got to enjoy the place you're at but they've got financial aid available they've got training coming right down from the the manufacturers themselves are are working with the uh, curriculum instructors at these schools so they can really get you accurate information they've got a ton of courses available check them out at uti.edu that's universal technical institute Let's go to North Carolina and talk to Gerald. You're on the Under the Hood Show. Gerald, what can we do for you? Hello, buddy. How you doing? Fantastic. What can I've, we do for you? I've got an 01 Ranger XL pickup. It's extended cab, 4.0 V6, automatic overdrive. Great truck. I've had the truck for 10 years now, and it developed a miss at road speed between 45 and like 65 miles an hour, and we changed the uh, plugs, got lifetime guaranteed plug wires, we cleaned the throttle body, cleaned the fuel injectors, we put a new coil pack on it, and that's at one shop, another shop, oh put a new fuel filter, <laughs> EGR valve solenoid, EGR valve sensor, and cleaned the mass air flow sensor, and it still does it, so now... The shop, my most trusted mechanic, his shop has got the truck, and he kept it for two days and studied it, and he, he has determined, I believe, that it's the computer is causing the issue. Does that sound like it's about right there on that? or Sounds like you've thrown enough darts with the parts that um, you're out of darts. You're right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my. I... If I had felt this and drove it, I might still lean towards an ignition miss. I've seen people throw a lot of parts at a vehicle like you've done, and in the end it turns out to be, yes, they had a bad coil on it, but they replaced it. But the coil they put on it to replace it had a problem. Or they replaced all six spark plugs, and one of them came in a box that had been dropped, so the porcelain was cracked on it, and it still did it again. So I'm going to be wanting to narrow down and know exactly what is causing this misfire. I'm going to, in my own shop, I'm going to put a lab scope on it and watch the ignition, just an oscilloscope, and it's going to show me the spark pattern from the coil windings all the way down to the spark plug, and I'm going to see which spark plug is misfiring or if it's all six. I want to find out what's going on, and if I see just one misfire, and I can narrow that down and say, oh, look, I've got a crack in the porcelain on this plug. It's a bad plug. I've got a bad wire. The wire's bad. i got a bad coil. Something's going on in the coil. Or is my pattern problem coming before the ignition coil? And that would tell me it's coming from the computer. I've got an issue that's coming out of the computer, so maybe my computer's got a problem, or maybe even my crankshaft sensor's got a problem. I have seen on this model truck people put a starter on one, and when they put the starter on one, they have run the starter, the power wire for the battery. Yeah, I remember a call like this. Yep, too close to the crankshaft sensor. And when they do that, that well, they're also running the alternator wire runs down that same area for charging, and it can cause interference in the crankshaft sensor and cause a misfire. So there are, there are lots of things to look for, but sometimes it takes a little more digging to narrow it down. But surely once you spend all this money on oh parts so far, unless they've put on another part, that was they replaced a bad part with another faulty part, then you've got something completely else out there, and you're about running out of parts to throw at it. Gerald, right. have you got any check engine lights on or anything? Do what now? Is there any check engine lights come on or anything? No. Well, the only thing it would do when it would misfire like that, the uh, check engine light at times would just flicker like. 
as it was doing that, which indicates I've been told a definite misfire. Is it a steady flash, or is it just like a fl- little flicker, like trying to come on that doesn't like, like a flicker? Uh, I, yeah, you like know? a flicker, you know, yeah, like a flash. Okay. You know, just, yeah. Because a misfire will give you a steady on off on off on. It's if, steady. If you have a bad misfire that, that but if it's, it's trying to tell you, hey, watch out. I'm you know. So if you lose power to the computer or you've got a faulty computer, it can cause the check engine light to just kind of half lit, you know. Like a brownout. And, yep, just on and off at random times. Yeah, that, that might lean me towards a power issue going to that computer or ground issue or a faulty computer. But, but if, if, the, if the problem is duplicatable, if it always has this misfire, you still can figure that out with your, with your scope, correct? Yes. I can't, yes. but he can. Right, right, right. <laughs> One of us can do it. <laughs> does that help you out there, Gerald? Get you in a... Yeah, it does. It right. does. It does. That that gives me, yeah, that gives me hope that I'm going to get it straightened out. Well, and then yeah. you can also have hope that all of the other parts are going to be really good. Yeah, really? You've got a bunch of new stuff. If you had a vacation planned, you might have to wait six months. <laughs> Gerald, thanks very much for the call. That was exciting when, we, when you narrowed in on that. That felt, I felt the change in the... Atmosphere there. It felt Dude, good. It was like a drop in yeah. barometric pressure. 866-594-4150. Let's go to North Dakota and talk to Don. Don, you're on the Under the Hood Show. What can we do for you? Whoa. Yeah, kind of a foolish question. But <laughs> my 99 Buick LeSabre Limited and still a beautiful car and everything runs great yet. Only has 157000 on it. And uh, the right... This is front side by the in front by the right front wheel. It rusted it out so doggone bad they can't even repair it. Yeah. Just, oh yeah, the air you can't keep air in the tire. Is that what you're having for a problem? No, the body. The oh, frame. I thought you said oh. the right front tire. I I uh, heard the, you wrong. So. Gotcha. Not the fender, but the frame itself, yeah. right? So the suspension's yeah. coming apart. Yeah, the subframe yeah. and stuff. Yeah, and so bad that they can't do nothing with it. Well, so here's the thing: does the if you if you didn't know that that frame was rusted, does the body look good on it? Oh yeah, okay. I've taken good care of it, and it runs good. Oh yeah, yeah. Okay. If it runs good and it looks good on the outside, they'll have to take a look. If it's just what they call the subframe, it is definitely repairable. And it's not a huge expense. Not as bad as one would think. Yeah, but it is. I mean, it, it costs. It's cost some money, but it's not the end of the car for sure. If it's the subframe that's rusted out, if you can put your hand through it, and the suspension's coming off. Yeah, we because that's we a do piece that. that on bolts out from the bottom mm-hmm. of the car. The control arms hooked to it. The motor mounts hooked to it. Right. But you can you can tie things up from the top and drop that out from the bottom and replace it. We do five or six or so, maybe a you know a dozen frame replacements a year at our shop because of rust really? now yeah so but if the body itself once they take the frame out if the body that the bolts go into that's gone yeah the car's got to be retired we we need to see it down at our place and it'll have a date with the crusher but uh if the body is good which is i'd say almost all of them the body's just fine it's usually that subframe that rusts out because salt and snow and mud gets in there ask him if it's the subframe it, say hey guys if you replace my subframe would my car be safe again and if they say well yeah maybe they're just assuming that you don't want to fix it so they're not even giving you you a could price. probably pick up a 99 lesaber subframe that's not rusty for probably a hundred dollars two hundred dollars <laughs> in a used one okay and then uh-huh. have, then there's labor to replace it and you might find that doing that replacement mechanic shop might look at it and said I don't know if I want to do that but there's sometimes like a frame shop or an alignment shop that specializes in suspension repair, they might be one that would do that repair more affordably because they are better equipped to, to set right. up to do that. Uh, so there might be some options there, but the big difference, Russ nailed it right on the head, is it the suspension subframe or K-frame that's rusted out, or is it the actual unibody structure of the car that's rusted out? That's what you got to determine. And they made that, that model of that, there's... They made seven hundred billion of those, right? Maybe more. Maybe more. So they're <laughs> they are available. Don, does that help yeah. you out? Yeah, thank you very much. You bet. Thanks very much for the call. I have an idea for you, Shannon. For me? Yeah, this Just is me. A, a business opportunity. Okay, all right. Uh, thinking Let me about make Don's a car, business opportunity you and, can't refuse, and crushing it. I think you should get one of those big shredders. 
Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I love that show. First of all, that's as far as I got. But then I came up with this. You could charge people to come watch stuff get thrown in it, build like a platform that's safe, you know, back a little bit, but high enough. A viewing platform? Yeah, just invite. Like on Saturday, hey, on June 10th, we're going to. And you could pay more to watch your own car be shredded? Yeah. Yeah. They used to have a TV show doing that, and one of my favorites is when they threw a school bus into one of those things, and it just ate it up like a wood chipper. Or in one could, end and out the other. Anything. You could if throw I was, away the couch that your ex-wife. If I was actually in the scrap business, mm-hmm. I'd probably consider that. <laughs> yeah. But that's not our main yeah. gig. You, you could move a lot. more When we're sending off, what? how many cars go on that once our crusher comes here and crushes cars? And we've got a video on our YouTube mm-hmm. channel mm-hmm. showing that. How many cars on average goes out per transport crushed? 18. Okay, 18. Like if okay. they were shredded, you could probably get... 50 or more in the back of a reefer trailer. Yeah. But I, a shredder is a the cool very factor. expensive piece of equipment. <laughs> no, they said the they were only al- like 30, 40 million bucks oh, for a big uh, one. But the maintenance alone to run one of those is, is more than I care to take on. That's what they showed. Those hammers were <laughs> yep. being replaced yeah. constantly. Yep, and they cost thousands of dollars a piece. Those things are so powerful, they will take like a big diesel truck, semi tractor trailer engine block. Goes in one end and out the other in like three seconds. I think on our YouTube channel we've got a shredding video yeah. that is one of the videos that's got a lot of views on it. Uh, I don't. It's been there for a little bit, mm-hmm. but I think there's a shredding video in there somewhere. I wanna, I wanna get a hold of one of those. Although I do have to say, we sometimes will pass them on YouTube and they make me uncomfortable, man. <laughs> watching those videos, you don't want to be close to it. I just when I'm watching it, I think. Oh, I would try stuff that would. The viewing <sighs> platform would be difficult because occasionally. When people don't do what they're supposed to do, you, they have That's explosions. Fine. That's fine. They it's they fine. like pretty don't. violent, you know, kickback just, explosions. Just get one. We're gonna take a break. <laughs> when we come back, we want to hear from you. Eight six six five nine four four one five zero. You're listening to the Under the Hood Show. car feeling ill don't want to spread it to your wallet call the motor medics now for free advice 
866-594-4150. Let's talk to Gary. Gary, you're on the Under the Hood Show. What can we do for you? Yeah, good morning, guys. Um, hey, I my wife has got a 15 BMW X5, and I think if I remember correctly, it's got the N55 motor. Is that Does that sound right to you in it? Okay. Well, the codes we don't anyway, probably, we don't always get right on top of. I usually run my life by interchange numbers. <laughs> okay. Well, anyway, and I think if I remember hearing, Russ has got specialized training or something in with BMW. But anyway, what I've got going on here, and I've noticed it a little more and more, she's got about 120,000 miles on this vehicle. And um, when you add oil, um, which this thing doesn't have a dipstick, so it tells you when you need it. But under the oil fill cap, it, it's got a kind of a, a whitish, creamy-looking color, which tells me that there's an excess of moisture in the uh, crankcase. And if the uh, filler cap looks like that, I'm sure the – I mean, you can't even hardly see anything in there, but I'm sure it's got rocker arm covers. I mean, I, the top of that motor has got to be filled with this sludge, and it uh, requires the castor oil. It's, you know, that's what it requires, the 5W30. But to me, I'm, I mean, we're not losing coolant, and the engine is running at the right temperature. Where is this coming from? If, uh, I would think that the detergent in the oil should keep that clean. Well, I'm going to, I just want to jump back on your identification here. So this is the, X5 with is that the bi turbo motor in that or is it is it the uh, which 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 motor is that I know you gave me the code but I, well I wish I knew I asked my son and he he called it the N55 yeah, which, no, that, that's, um, I just don't know those codes right off the top of my head on that model my wife and I have a yeah have an X uh, BMW also and they have long oil change intervals that they recommend and the computer uh -huh. is you know the the programming in the computer and the sensing that it does is a long duration. You know, and of course, they're using a high-quality oil. I'm guessing if we pulled the cap on Shannon's car, it'd be bone dry because he drives the crap out no, of it. No, no, actually, it's been sitting for a few months. We haven't drove That's it That's all yet, right. So. But if it sits and then you drive the crap out of it, you're good to go. Yeah. Your car is the short trip problem. You're saying you're talking about Gary's problem. Gary's problem, yeah. So, Gary, I would bet if you got in this car, you had any trips to take anytime coming up soon? Because if you do... Well, no, she, yeah. yeah, she's in Wisconsin right now, but she'll be driving to uh, South Alabama here next week. Okay. And when she really, pulls in... I mean, as far as... Yeah. When she pulls in, pull the cap off the oil and see if it's dry in there. If it's just oily, I bet it is. I bet the white film is gone. What that comes from, it's condensation from moisture buildup from trips that are not long enough to completely heat the oil burn the moisture out, and then have it removed by the PCV system. So, okay. you know, I, I really doubt you've got a major problem in the engine. I just think it hasn't been run long enough on trips to get it thoroughly heated to, to remove that out. And the, the cap is so far away from the rest of the engine, it's the coolest part of the engine, so that's where you're going to get your condensation. Metal parts are going to be hotter down in the engine. So if you did take the rocker cover off, you may find that it's completely fine inside we had lots of these a part of the dealership over the years and at our shop and we'll pull the cover off and it's like wow this thing looks like brand new why is the oil cap so white and it's just simply white because that's the coolest part that's where the condensation goes well i did ask the dealer that and he said any car that's in our lot with over sixty thousand, he says i bet you pull, take that cap off and it's going to look the same yep now we do live in a rural area and Generally, her trips are twenty to thirty miles. You know, at about sixty-five, seventy. That, that's miles that's hour. way better than people yeah. that drive ten or fifteen that, and never that see the great. thermostat up all the way even. But typically, it takes over an hour of driving at higher speeds in order to get it hot enough to burn that moisture out of the oil. Or you, you have consistent heat in the engine yeah. for a long period of time. You got to get that engine up, you know, oil up around. Like my car, I was looking at the Camaro coming in this morning, and the engine oil was at two twelve, so that was plenty hot to get that. Oh moisture burned out of it and then the PCV system's doing its job but it's not quite a long enough trip because it turned into about 212 after 15 minutes of driving and I only had five minutes left to go so yeah I th I think in in you're probably just fine with it and you're you're using that right oil in there if you're using the, the castrol in there like you're supposed to 
changing it on time and using the proper oil is the, the best thing you can do for that engine. Because those detergents and chemicals in there, because of the, the climate you live in, and you know that the hots and colds have been crazy here in, in the northern belt, so that doesn't help either. Mm-hmm. So it's very important to pay attention to those intervals. Gary, thanks very much for the call. 866-594-4150. That's a perfect candidate for Chris's car service. Where I drive your Where car. Where you drive your car. Yeah, to get it up to engine temp and get it all set. Let's talk to Rich. Rich, you're on the end of the hood show. What can we do for you? Hey, good morning, guys. Thanks for taking my call. You bet. Uh, I called a couple of months ago in regards to my 2016 uh, Nissan, uh, Nissan, Hyundai uh, Tucson with oil consumption issues. Yes. And you might recall, I don't know. I, I, you know, I do. How'd, the, you, how'd with, you turn out? What have you learned? With the amount of, well, this is what has happened since then. I just wanted to update you guys just in case uh, there's any other listeners that might have be running into these problems. But this is where I'm at with this issue. I've had it in there three times for, uh, they wanted to see the oil. Uh, consumption uh, three times. The, the second time, I had to leave it there all day because they had to take the valve cover off, take pictures, and send it to Hyundai. And they topped it off. We haven't heard back from Hyundai yet. They topped it off and said, we want you to bring it in between twelve and 1,500 miles, which was one day last week. I brought it in. I was down a quart and three quarters in 1,250 miles. Oh, boy. They... They told me this does not meet Hyundai's criteria for doing anything about it. Hmm. Say, well, so well. this is a this is a tremendous disappointment, and I I really thought uh, they suggested I call uh, the customer service and and you can write a letter and stuff and everything. But they're doing it. They topped it off again, and they and they want to see it again in between a thousand and twelve hundred miles. So I don't, know, I don't know how much longer this is going to go on for, but I'm really, really disappointed in how Hyundai's reacting to my problem. I, I do know, in talking to some people that I that I know well, that because of I got to make sure how I say this, but just saying it like it is, because of certain engines and certain models that they have had some problems with, it does seem that Hyundai and Kia have taken an approach that they are going to they're going to take some steps. And make sure those steps are taken so that people don't stereotype the problem they've heard about with their particular car. And so what you're doing right now, I would follow their recommendations. I would, I would document with a letter to customer service what you're experiencing. Because both Russ and I, in our professional opinions, and Chris as a host of the show, the Curtis Forever, would agree that that is too much oil in that short of a period of time for a vehicle like that. It, Most it, cars don't use a drop of oil on the stick. Yeah, you know, I mean, in typical I could see an use. argument they'd make if you had, I think you remember right, when you called in, you had like seventy or 80,000 miles on this vehicle, if I remember right? Uh, so right now it's at 77. Yeah, I remember, I remember when you called in. And so I could see maybe a half a quart in a 4,000 or 5,000 mile interchange as saying, you know what? This thing's wearing a little bit. We can deal with that. A quart every thousand is going to ruin the catalytic exactly. converters. Exactly. It's not good. And so... I would continue with what they're doing, be professionally persistent, and I, I hope that they do something for you. But uh, that is, uh, is something for other listeners to hear because they're having you do an oil consumption test is what they're calling it. Mm-hmm. You know, and so. Is there a chance there that, that what they're saying he should do is just like their book do this, and that, then once you get I mean. three more steps, there, we, they'll probably do there's that. There's many things in life like this, and I'm running across issues in a lot of different areas of my life like this where our typical reaction is we want to yell and scream and get what we want. Mm-hmm. Um, but the reality is the world doesn't work that way. No, shops won't help you that it, way. I mean, a <laughs> shop or a public board or whatever it is. I mean, if I, <laughs> the, the, the person that is going to be able to work through a process is going to be more successful than someone that just – yells and screams and thinks they're going to get what they want. I mean, and then we've kind of trained our country to think that's the way the world works. Mm -hmm. I don't like that. I got to do something different. Sorry. Won't work. It's just, we've got to learn to have some, some process because there is reasons why a manufacturer has a process because otherwise do they give a a new motor to everybody that comes in the dealership and says, you know, I think I'm using some oil. Right. That doesn't make any sense either. Uh, So they, they, they have to establish the boundaries and then manage 
what happens in the middle. <laughs> or they might need to be timing new motors for <laughs> yeah, yeah. Or, it could, or or it could be that they just haven't finished the the class action lawsuit yet. <laughs> Rich, does that help that's, you out? That's another thing too. I googled this and, and, and I came up with uh, some very very important information that at one time there was a class action suit for the 2016 to 2019 Hyundai Tucson's, but the the, the lawsuit has been dropped. Yeah, there's just. I'm just going to say keep learning, be persistent, and hopefully you get where you need to get with them. A lot of times they're dropping those when the manufacturer has stepped up and done more repairs on them and they do some digging and they're investigating and they find out there wasn't near as many as they thought there were and the repairs are being done. So I think Shannon's right. If you got a car like this, what do you have, a 10-year, 100,000-mile warranty on it? It was 660. Okay, so you got a little bit of time left. I or, or no, you're out He's now. Out, so. Yeah, yeah. I would I would keep on it, be gentle with them, but persistent, like Shannon said, and we'll document we'll hope everything the best you do, for keep you. a date stamp, and just keep working at it. Rich, thanks very much for the call. Good luck. That does not sound like a fun situation to be in. Nope. That'll do it for this hour of the Under the Hood Show. Hour two is coming up. We'd love for you to stick around and give us a call. 866-594-4150.
You're listening to the Nordstrom's Under the Hood Show with the Motor Medics, Shannon Nordstrom and Russ the Super Tech Evans. Shannon is an ASC engine and parts specialist, and Russ is an ASC master certified technician with extensive factory drivability training. Join the Motor Medics for fun and free automotive advice with real world solutions to everyday automotive problems. The Under the Hood Show is heard weekly on this and other great radio stations across the U.S. Find out how you can participate in the show by visiting underthehoodshow.com. With Russ Evans, this is Shannon Nordstrom thanking you for tuning in to the Nordstrom's Under the Hood Show. Have a great day and remember, PTLA. The opinions heard on this program, based on the many years of experience of Russ and Shannon, are offered for entertainment value only and as a guide to your repair needs. No claim to repair or cause is given or implied. Always consult with your own certified technician and follow all safety procedures before attempting any repair. To be a part of the show, call 866-594-4150. Under the Hood is produced by Prairie House Productions. All content is the property of Nordstrom's Automotive Incorporated and may not be used without our permission. Copyright Nordstrom's Automotive Inc. Now, let's go Under the Hood with the Nordstrom's Motor Medics. Welcome to the Under the Hood show from the Autotempest.com studios. All the cars, one search. This is the Under the Hood show. Russ Evans is here to answer your automotive questions. Thanks for joining us under the hood. Shannon Nordstrom is here to do the same. Welcome, hoodies. Thanks for tuning in so we can help you tune up. I'm Chris Carter here to answer your calls at 866-594-4150. We've got calls coming in as the show started, so let's get right to them. We don't want, we don't want to have to pay that phone bill. <laughs> nope. <laughs> let's talk to Mike. Mike, you're on the Under the Hood show. What can we do for you? Good morning. Thank you guys for all you do. You're very welcome. Thank you. I have a 2016 six liter Chevy three quarter ton. And yesterday, just driving along, it started missing and, and shut down on me. Started right back up, no problems again until this morning. I was pulling kind of a long hill with it and it started missing. And as long as I didn't push too hard on it, it would keep moving along, but if I kind of got after it, it'd just start cutting out and uh, missing pretty bad. Um, I was just wondering if that would be a, a fuel issue. There's no codes or anything, or if could it be like plugs and coils, or would that throw a code, an engine code? It's hard to believe that plugs and coils would give you that result and just suddenly start doing it, in my opinion. I mean, Russ is, you know, that's, that's, that's a similar six liter that we have in our Isuzu delivery trucks. Uh, that, that, uh, it's a real similar motor. I'm leaning more towards fuels. The more you're pushing into it, the, the more the problem is typically with a misfire where you've got a coil or a plug or a wire or something like that, you know, ignition miss, it's going to misfire under a light load, like slightly uphill 40 to 50 mile an hour range, right, right in there, 35 to 40, 50 miles an hour. Um, but if they fall on their face, the more fuel you try to get them, usually the pump is starting to, they put the filter inside of the pump assembly. And as though those go bad, this is what you get. And it's actually common for us because we put fuel filters in our over the road trucks, the, the whole pump assembly, because the, the filter's not separate any longer. We're doing those, you know, every couple of years. And it's, it's, uh, well, it's exactly it, also, all it also makes me think that if he had a misfire that was that bad, that would make the truck not run right, he'd be getting a check engine light if it was based on most likely, if it was most likely, if it was based on something in the, in the ignition system, he'd be getting that misfire code or he'd be getting something. But the fact that it's not coding makes me think it's in that base fuel system and it's just not able to produce, that- enough, not able to produce enough volume of fuel when you're pushing on it, it may have fuel pressure if you checked it, but it may not have enough fuel volume. Right. To you know to, to power. And that's what it acted like. Russ, how would you test it? You, you know, you can you, sit at an <laughs> you can sit at an idle with it and wrap it clear up to 4,500 or something, and it'll run smooth. And it's a really heavy pickup. I'm pushing 10,000 pounds, yeah. and when I get under that hard load, it just falls on its face. So you kind of you confirm my suspicions. I appreciate that. We test them with a fuel pressure gauge and watch them to see what's going on. And usually we see them fall off. They fall on their face when they start start dying like that. You've, you've got to verify because there could be, you know, 
two dozen things causing this issue, but we would definitely, because of what we know and what we've seen in this type of vehicle, we definitely put a fuel pressure gauge on it. And, and watch it that. as you're driving it and see mm-hmm. what it does. For sure. Hey, thanks for being a hoodie. Mike, thanks very much for the call. 866-594-4150. Let's talk to Michael. You're on the Under the Hood Show. What can we do for you? Well, good morning, gentlemen. I just want to uh, piggyback on what the other people would say in regards to thank you for your show. Thanks for the information you give. Uh, there, thank you. People just even listen. There's a lot of inf- good information, so thanks for your guys' uh, expertise. Thank I you. have a question for you, and I'd like to share something, too. Uh, got a 2017 Hyundai Tucson. Um, spark plugs are supposed to be changed right around 105,000 miles, which seems quite a bit to me. Vehicle's got about 94,000 miles on it. Um, the question I pose to you is, um, when I talked to the guys at the, uh, uh, the parts store, they said, you know, focus on the spark plugs, not a problem. And, uh, and then they also talked that, you know, if, you're, if your spark plugs are bad or, or need to be changed, which in this case I think probably uh, probability is a good thing to do. What about the ignition coil? Because as I understand it, talking to them at the parts store, that um, once the ignition coil goes, you, you really don't know um, when it's going to drop out. So consequently, it shuts down the cylinder. Is that going to cause problems for the vehicle? And or should a guy, a person consider changing the spark plugs and the ignition coils at the same time so you kind of know what you have? Your thoughts? Yes. Uh, coils. They do fail, and they fail kind of spontaneously. Once they hit about 100,000 miles, they could go any time. you get got a lot of heat buildup in there. you got a very fine hair, less than a strand of hair for this coil that's built inside of this epoxy resin, and they can just open up and fail, or you can get a weak spot in the side of the casting. That can come from when they were originally made, when they're poured, um, or just break down over the years. You get these little... Fissures open up in there, and then they arc to ground as their least path, least path of uh, resistance. So they can fail. And we do find that a lot of people, as a tune-up item, since you're not replacing a plug wire anymore, they're putting a coil boot with the coil complete on there and a spark plug in that 100,000-mile Because for people range. listening, if, if you've looked at it now, most engines, this coil sits right on top of the spark plug, basically. And then there's, like Russ said, a little boot in between there. Um, budget-wise, makes a difference for people, no doubt. Right. If, you're, if, yeah. you're, if your budget allows and you could do coil and plug, I'm, I, look, I think of a lot of people that we had over the years with like Ford pickups and stuff like that, we would highly recommend coil and plug. And in other areas with vehicle where it's hard to access, you know, it's very difficult to get at, say, the back bank of spark Ford plug. Escape. Yeah, that's Six an excellent cylinder. one. Pull the intake off to get to them. Exactly. So if you're in there working on a spark plugs, you, and definitely, you know, and you know there's it. miles on it, boy, budget to get that coil on there is. The, our recommendations are similar, but I just want to give some levity to it because I don't want people out there thinking, "Those radio guys said I got to get coils." Well, you really should, yeah. but if your budget doesn't allow it, or maybe it's a four hundred dollar a piece coil for some stupid reason, which some can be, then you might say, "You know what? I'm just I can access it easy. I can see it." And I think your question in there somewhere was, if that coil fails and I get a misfire, am I going to hurt my engine? You can, or you your can. catalytic converter. You can, but if you catch it right away, typically you won't. Well, our partner Motorrad sells coils for many, many, many cars as part of their electronic engine components. The reason that they have developed the great product and they sell it is because there is a huge need in the market to replace these things as Tune-up items, they're not just one of those things that fails like an alternator fails now and then. It's a major failure issue, and a tune-up item that's done is maintenance, and we definitely suggest it. So if you do need to put some coils on it, think about the motor rad coils. We're going to take a break. Michael, thanks very much for the call. 866-594-4150. You're listening to the Under the Hood Show.
Get your planner out right now and schedule your next radio appointment with the Motor Medics. 866-594-4150. From the Autotempest.com studios, all the cars, one search. This is the Under the Hood Show. Let's go to Oklahoma and talk to Harold. You're on the Under the Hood Show. Harold, what can we do for you? Yes, sir. I have a 2010 F-150 four-wheel drive, a 5.4 engine with 336,000 miles on it. I think awesome. I am. <laughs> yes. It, it's a nice pickup. I don't want to get rid of this thing. <clears throat> I do think, though, that my transmission is starting to get a little weak, and I believe that you had mentioned where I could get uh, maybe rebuilt transmissions or such, and I made a mistake in not writing that information down one time. Yeah, you know what? I that So I just got to ask you on your 2010 F-150, with that many miles on it, what have you done to it, or what's your routine? Now, I think your your climate is friendly to a long life on things down there, but what, what have you done to get to that mileage number? Uh, a guy told me I drive like grandma. <laughs> <laughs> I, that run could a, do it. I, I run a uh, rural mail route of about 120 miles a day, a lot of start and stop. That does not... Yeah. I, run conducive to 340,000 no. well, miles. First gear should be worn out, but the rest of them should be like brand new. Well, no, the engine even. That's that's pretty cool. Yeah. Keeps, tell me more. What else do you do? What's your, what's your oil uh, change that's routine? Pretty much what, I change my own oil about every 6,000. Uh, the transmission has had the fluid and filter changed twice, I think. <laughs> the uh, motor is still good. I... I'm sure wouldn't want to give it up. You know, it's running well. Maybe a quart of oil every 6,000 miles. I'm proud uh, of you. The only thing it's had is an old bigger and uh, a little bit of front-end work on it. Not very much. I will say I'm completely impressed. And I think that you should buy also lottery tickets at some point in the near future. Sure. I'm amazed. <laughs> as far as the transmission and, goes, uh <laughs> I'm, still, I'm just kind of pausing because we do see these trucks with a bunch of miles on them. There's no doubt. But they've usually had, um, you know, something done with the timing chain or the cam phasers or something uh, somewhere along the way. Now, the 2010 was into the next generation, but we've seen plenty of, plenty of challenges in that generation of, you know, All from, from 9 to 14 or whatever it is. But, uh, hey, that's good. That's awesome. But I think the biggest thing is that he does. Yeah. He's using it every day, and he's getting in, yep. engine temperature into it. And if he drives those short trips, like, well, an old, I, like an old lady, as he said, he's being really cautious on his start and stops, yeah. and he's not, and he's he, keeping it running for exactly hours. It, yeah, it just keeps going. Yeah. It's kind of like an idling excavator almost at that point that they do with diesel engines and that sort of thing. The transmissions, there's, there's Cam good. Phaser. Go ahead. Cam phasers were done about thirty-five thousand miles. Ago. Okay, but you did them, and, and they had success with that, too. Yes. Oh, my. That's, yeah. a, that's awesome. I, this, we, pickup has, this pickup has run in four-wheel drive only when necessary. There you because go. Because four-wheel drive is, is to get you out of trouble, not to get you into trouble. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it can do both, but that's well yeah. said. Well said. Well, you were asking, we, you know, we've talked about different remanufactured transmission vendors on the show before that we've had success with ourselves personally. And um, at, our, at our personal company website at NordstromsAuto.com, we have availability of a couple different vendors. And we work with both certified transmissions and we work with um, um, AER uh, transmissions out of Texas. We work with both of them. And they're, they've been good vendors for us. Um, we've had good success with their products. And you may check and find that locally at a, at a transmission shop in your market. Find one that's a member of the Automatic Transmission Rebuilders Association. Yes. Because they're going to be certified, very ATRA. smart, trained. Yep. Yeah, trained well, it's, a big, it's a big association. For those it guys. is. It is. Huge. But um, you can look up their roster on the website and find a shop that, that you could go see what they recommend. They've seen enough of these 2010 F-150s. It might be such a thing. You know what? I got a guy here that that bench rebuilds these, um, and we'll just we'll just bench rebuild yours, and it's going to cost this much money. 
or we can get the reman replacement, drop it in, have it out in a day and a half or in a day and, and do that too, and it's going to cost this much money. So you've got some options. But uh, I, I would find a local transmission shop, uh, ask some questions at your parts stores on, on you know, some of these transmission shops. Many of them are independents. That are, you know, I know we've got one in our market. One, we've got a bunch in our market. They all do really good. And so um, I, I would check on that. But the, the, the brands I mentioned are the ones that we, we have success with. that help you out there, Harold? Yes, sir. I will do that. Thanks very much for the call. Congratulations on the long life of your Ford. We're very impressed. 866-594-4150. Let's talk to Shiloh. You're on the Under the Hood Show. What can we do for you? Oh, Shiloh's gone. Everybody's gone. Oh, no. I don't know if I did that or not. We're here. 866-594-4150. Was that you? I don't know. You hit a drop all button. Whoops. There's a drop all button? Oh, no. Now I'm afraid. (laughs) Uh, what's caught your attention in the automotive world? I don't really have much to say about this, but I just recently read a long article that was kind of an oral history article where they talk to different people and go through the timeline of the Dieselgate scandal. Oh, oh with, with the Volkswagen Been a very thing? long time Holy since we've talked about that. Holy, that was something else. That uh... I envy your ability to take the time and have the time to listen. I probably could. I just have to recommit what I'm putting my time into. Got a question for you, Chris. Mm-hmm. If that news dropped 12 months ago, right in the middle of the COVID thing oh, and the yeah. shortages coming out on cars and all that, do you think it would be any different in the way it all oh, went about than now? Question. Hey, now we've got to pull even more cars off the road and we already have a shortage. I mean, would it be a bigger oh. news or lesser news? It's It's hard to say. I wonder. That is a good question. That's what my, that, to answer your question though, Shannon, that's why my weekend mornings when I'm texting you ideas at 5.30 in the morning, it's because I'm up reading, yeah, and reading I, news. And I'm not. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely yeah. not. Yeah. But man, that was, uh, whew, so what was, it, what was your big takeaway from that? It that, was some, that was some sneaky stuff. Are you saying sneaky in regards to what they were doing <laughs> yeah. or what the, the punishment was? No, the what they were doing. Did you feel the punishment matched the crime after you listened to it? Your own uh, personal opinion? They paid just in America $21 billion in fines and restitution. That, that seems like a lot. doesn't count all the cars that they had to bring back. Right. That was just the, I, and maybe that does, but. I'd be curious how those numbers are spit up. I, I know it was a crazy amount of money. That was just the American, the settlement, the fines and stuff they paid. And, and, and <laughs> it was, they would, it just was going down what they found and then what they, oh man. It, how that, did you get into that one? I just saw an article about it. Just, you know, the, going through news feeds and seeing the the article about the diesel gate and what. It was that. It was a timeline or an oral history of that. And, and for I people listening, this was in regards to where, where Volkswagen was caught um, basically setting up their vehicles to pass in a testing environment mm-hmm. for emissions. But then once they got to real world use, it was not the same results. They, they were basically programmed for specific uh, testing. So your car... Your specific car was programmed that if you if you brought it to the place and they were testing it, it would pass. And then as soon as the test was over, it would go back to just not doing that. And if you programmed the car in order to pass all the time, which it should have, your fuel mileage would just go <laughs> gone. Because they touted this car as being those diesel engines as being, they're like the miracle worker of diesel engines. They get such good fuel it, mileage. And... Why all of a sudden when they didn't really and, redesign it? And just to throw it, you know, everybody likes to put their bow on top of something, but the hard part of it is always for me is, and I'm, I, I care about our environment, and I do. I really do. But I think sometimes we take such extreme steps. This car was putting out extra emissions for sure. But, you know, the level but it, it was But it was still cleaner out, than so many that others. Was the, and the cleanliness of it is still pretty good. The part in the article that caught my eye was that they went into that pretty in depth, and that it was, it was worse than we all thought. Right, the, each, the cars were too. Oh yeah, but but even, but if you take that car at its worst, it's it's I don't want to say at times because I don't know. Yeah, but it, it is so much better 
than a 1981 Caprice Classic with a 5.7 <laughs> right. diesel in it that we made at one time. Sure. It's not even close. And they were going further per gallon of fuel, which also helped if the car would have only been like one that got I, I try 25. to keep some levity to Ooh. that, but, yeah, yeah. but if you're true environmentalist, yeah, the car was much more of a polluter than they wanted but it to be. What have they done now? If you take a 2020 or even a 2019 or 18 model, these newer ones, and look at what they've done, Holy smokes, they're clean. Yeah. You can't, you know, well, eat off the tailpipe, <laughs> but they are. <laughs> Chris isn't sure if he trusts it. <laughs> no, According there. to the testing they're using. Now let's yeah, try it. Let's talk to great. Shiloh now. Shiloh, you're on the end of the hood show. What can we do for you? Hi, I'm calling about my uh, 2007 Lincoln Mark LT pickup truck. Um, when I'm driving it from Sioux Falls to Sioux City, I don't really know what transmission slip feels like, but. Uh, when I'm trying to get a little bit more power to go up a hill or just get back up to 80, 85, I am, like, my truck surges a little. Like, it jumps almost like it's got a hard misfire, but I'm not sure what it is. My only engine code is a knock sensor, but everybody says they don't think it's the knock sensor, and I got to get it checked out, but I just don't have time to leave my truck at a shop to get it, you know, figure out what the actual problem is. So I was wondering if there's something I could do myself to try to figure this out. Well, hopefully that problem you're having that's setting a knock code isn't something that's damaging the engine. It sounds like an ignition type of miss where you've got some coils that are failing. I mean, one of the first things to do, if you've got a vehicle that's got, uh, you know, it's an 07. If the coils haven't been changed just because of age, I'd be putting a set of coils on it and a set of spark plugs. You can buy them as a group set of eight, buy the spark plugs as a set, put them in there because that's that's a good starting point because so many of these wrap right around that ignition system as a failure. And, and for people listening, this Lincoln Mark LT, I, I, please uh, don't take this, Shiloh, as anything different than what I'm saying. It, it is an F-150 that's really fancy. Mm -hmm. uh, it is what, yeah. you know, it's a very fancy, nice F-150. Pretty desirable truck. Yeah, so what we've learned about those trucks is there's a lot of them out there, and coil and, and, and those kind of problems are, are fairly common in that truck. Now, if you want to give yourself some assurances, and, and Russ, correct me if I'm wrong here, if you have paid attention to your engine tack over the years, uh, just kind of where your shift points are at, has that changed? Is it modified? I mean, is it is it jumping the gear, and then you see the tack make an extra jump? Some of that can be from misfire. No, so, but, I mean, do you, do you see anything like that? So when I'm watching, I, I always try to watch that to make sure when it's happening, I'm able to see if my tack is jumping, and it's not jumping or anything. It stays put. Everything, all my gauges stay put. It's at 213,000 miles and some change. I just had all my all my spark plugs redone, and I only had the money to do one coil pack, so it might be that, but my, my RPMs don't change. Okay, well, like that, that's, that sounds encouraging. So let's have you do this. Let's uh, check the transmission fluid. Make sure it's not smelly Bernie, because if that's the case, then you do have something else going on. But if the fluid still looks okay, let's work on that misfire. Need to do that soon. And from it, from experience, a misfire feels like a transmission slip. Very yes. often. Or can. Yes. Very often. We're going to take a break. When we come back, we want to hear from you on the Under the Hood Show. 866-594-4150.
Prepare to learn something. You're going under the hood. 866-594-4150. From the Autotempest.com studios, all the cars, one search. This is the Under the Hood Show. If you like our Facebook page and then join the Hoodie Fan Club at underthehoodshow.com, you could win a hoodie. Like Stu Pitts. He's from Bend, Oregon, listens to us on KBND. Congratulations from all of us here under the hood. Enjoy your hoodie. You're going to need it in those bitter Oregon nights there up in the mountains. Burr. Our partners over at Universal Technical Institute, uti.edu, have made that hoodie giveaway possible. Check them out. If you're thinking about any kind of a change towards the automotive Mm -hmm. industry or you want to further your career in the automotive industry by getting a little more training, uti.edu. 866-594-4150. Let's welcome Jim to the show. Jim, you're on the Under the Hood show. What can we do for you? Yeah, I got a... My daughter has a 2012 Dodge Journey they just recently purchased. And I did the thermostat deal. And I can't get decent heat. And they're saying heater core. But I'm not willing to... I'm not... Well, eager. <laughs> You're not eager oh, to spend. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and you know what? On we run into quite a few calls on some of these. Well, it's not just Chryslers, but we do see it on a number of Chryslers with similar issues. And I know Russ has had minimal success with a a, a better back flush tool that we have. I, it's a little more than minimal, but. It's I say not minimal, great, it's not, much but it's not a silver minimal. bullet. No, right. I, that is a perfect tool to use for maintenance. Every couple years, you pull the hoses off, sure. wash them out. It's going to keep it clean. Is it like way. an ultrasonic type deal, or is it? A, it's it's just simply pulsating. water garden hose that's blasting water in, and then it has compressed air going into the side of it, so it injects air in between, and just it's like. When you turn your water off in your house and you turn it back on, and then when you turn the faucet on, what happens? The water doesn't come out smooth. It, it's like yeah, it's bam, bam, my pants it's blasting usually. because of the water is you know different viscosity than the air, and you've got compressed you know different compression rates, so it forces it to, and you sometimes you get chunks of dirt out of your sink coming from your pipes. Imagine what you're drinking, folks. Ugh. So I was from being an old mechanic. I've done the old ones with compressed air do it. I'm afraid to try it on this newer one because I don't have that setup. You Just need the tool. It with too much air pressure, right. I blow the heater car out, and I have Correct. to replace it. Yeah, you definitely want to use the proper tool for that. I mean, you could that Gates tool, I think you'd get it off of Amazon for like fifty bucks. So it's not the end of the world if you wanted to try that. I mean, think of what it costs just to go to the shop and ask them what's wrong with it. And they go, Well, there's a hundred bucks and it's probably got a core out. But you could try that. And you could use it on any car from now on, but you just need an air compressor and a garden hose. Sure. Uh, and then it's regulated, so it keeps it safe. But try that. Go both ways with it, back and forth, flushing it, and do it for, you know, 10 minutes. It, it really get it as clean as you can. And if your heat do increases, yeah, if your heat increases at all, it's a guarantee the heater core's got some restriction. But if it doesn't change a bit, it could be something else. But typically, yeah. this product you have... Be that. is a heater That's what core. I've been told. And they just don't make a chemical anymore because of environmental reasons that will clean up the heater cores. They used to have some stuff that would clean it. And I've seen some people use some <laughs> I've crazy I've seen some stuff. people try some things. <laughs> I, I saw a guy pour some stuff into an Audi one time that was going to be almost a $2,000 heater core replacement. And it literally just exploded and went everywhere because it was a really bad chemical. But the heater worked great. <laughs> it, it, he, you know, it didn't kill himself, and it and the heater worked great. It didn't after, blow so. a hole right the, through the core. The trees no, are dead, no, but the no. car runs great. But it reacted <laughs> with that aluminum in there and just pff, like a volcano, you know, as kind of like that old Brady Bunch episode with the volcano where the kids made the. Yeah. You remember that one? Yeah, so, we made them at home too. It's always fun. The uh, does that help you out, Jim? Problem they called. The other problem they called me with just the other day is now they have a fresh oil leak, and they took it in and had it looked at, and they said, where you change the oil filter on that one, there's a cartridge on that V6, down in on the bottom of that valley, it's in there, and they're 300 and some dollars 
That's your oil. Yeah, that's your engine oil cooler, and it it does it does fail. Right now, they're very hard to get. There's like a six to eight month back order on it. But you, if you were a mechanic and you've got a little mechanical aptitude, they're not really hard to do. They just take some time. You got to pull the intake manifold. So you have to get some gaskets and you'll have to get an oil and cooler. And our partner, Dorman Products, does make an engine oil cooler that is a nice replacement unit for these vehicles. You could probably do it yourself for way less than half at home, and it's a it's something that you know I'm okay. confident most people can do. It's a, it's a matter of bolt on, no no special tools. You just unbolt the parts, bolt no the parts back on. Tool. Right, okay. the filter goes right into this oil cooler assembly. Um, yeah, just go to like DormanProducts.com, type in engine oil cooler, and it'll give you a drop down list of your type of vehicle, and it'll it'll make it easy for you to be able to change this. And or if you, you can put in your type of vehicle and see what products they have available for your vehicle, too. Right, and There's they've even got some installation videos cool. there it's as well. It's a good well. website. I'm going to go there next time I go to buy a car, and if there's a bunch of parts, I don't know if that makes me more confident or, or not. Well, it means they've got parts available to fix your car, but it might but not they, mean that car is so work. great, right? It, Jim, break a lot. <laughs> thanks very much for the call. could just be a mass-produced car that there's a lot of, too. That could be. You know, but it all kind of... You got to pay attention to 866 594 4150. Let's talk to Jim. You're on the Under the Hood Show. Jim, what can we do for you? With the cost of repairing or replacing an automatic transmission being so high, I do not understand why manufacturers do not install a drain plug on automatic transmission pans. The, the job it is to take one of those off is such a you know, pain and the cost to repair, like I said, is so high. I would think if manufacturers put a drain plug on, people would be a little more willing to add that to their normal maintenance schedule. Because I was watching a YouTube video and a guy had a Mazda with a CVT transmission and he only had 23,000 miles since his last fluid change. And he took the pan off and he showed how black the transmission fluid was after only 23,000 miles. And also in that pan, there were two magnets. And he showed how, how there were metal shavings already on those two magnets. And then he showed what clean transmission fluid looked like. And it was translucent. You could see right through it. So only after 23,000 miles, it was black. And a lot of manufacturers today say, yeah, you don't, you don't ever have to change your transmission fluid. I just don't get it. Why don't they put a drain plug on so it's not so difficult to flush that fluid more often? Well, I know exactly what it is. So the reason they don't do that is basically cost because in most cases their testing has shown that the car will make it out of the warranty period just fine if nobody touches it. Usually sometimes double the warranty period so they don't have to worry about it. And if they put a plug in there, while it seems like a pretty cheap part, Let's say it costs the, the actual part and the labor to stamp it into that pan is 50 cents per car. And this manufacturer makes 3 million cars a year. When they look overall at their expenses and they say, I have a list of 500 items that can save us $1.5 million a year, that looks great to a manufacturer. <laughs> now, if they've got one that takes a recommended change at a very early period, which a lot of the CVTs and some like some of the Honda products do, they have put some drain plugs on a few of those cars. If you go to the service manual and it says drain and fill transmission twice, and it's got a service interval like 60,000 miles, which a few cars do, we find those have drain plugs. But there's a lot of ones like you're ex specifically talking about this CVT, they could benefit from a fluid change, and many of those do not have any way to change it, and it is such a mess. We end up with more on the floor, even with a very large drain table to get underneath these things. I do want to address one thing you said just because some of that can be shock video, too, that you see um, because the magnets that are put in some of these items are designed to catch the factory you know, bits of shavings and castings. things, castings and, and things like that. First change will always be worse. Exactly. You're going to see that right away. And so now if you're putting a change on and it's got 100,000 miles on it, and you're still seeing that kind of stuff. And it's after been, it's been changed. After it's been changed once before, 
different story. But in the beginning, there is things they want those magnets to catch so that they don't have to come in and do a early Mm -hmm. change or flush. And, you know, Jim, we're also seeing a lot of pressure, I think, put on the manufacturers to extend intervals of maintenance. So in their in their approach to the customer, they can show a lower cost of ownership, even though the engineer side of you says, gosh, it should be better if they really did this and make right. it last longer. Not to say they don't care, but there's there's definitely obsolescence and intervals built into about every product. And that does all come into play when they start balancing those scales. When the bean counters and the engineers get together, I'm sure they have some very interesting conversations. Mm-hmm. <laughs> does that does that frustrating make frustrating though when oh it is the, the cost to repair a transmission or replace one is just outrageous if they and knew if they had a, just if, avoid that if yeah. they knew they had a high warranty failure right. you might see a different approach one of my texts came up to me on monday this last week and said hey look what they've done they put a drain plug in this pan and it happened to be a dorman products replacement pan for a jeep liberty and he says why don't they just do that from the factory? So it was kind of ironic that you have this call, Jim, and he had this question. And I said, well, that would be great. He goes, and his, the only thing he said to me was, he said, it would make it so much easier to drain it when I have to take this pan off and drain it because when we pull a used trans out, we drain all the fluids out of any product we take. We drain all the fluids. And if we have to take a pan off, it's just kind of going everywhere and it makes a mess. If we could just pull the plug, set it over the pan and let it drain, you know? I know our delivery drivers would like that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Jim, sure. thanks very much for the call. I'm going to put Jim on our idea team. Jim calls all the time with good ideas. He's a thinker. But between his ideas and my million dollar ideas, man, we big we think can tank. solve this thing. 866-594-4150. We're going to take a break. When we come back, we want to hear from you on the Under the Hood Show.
Be sure to visit our website for news, contests, and previous shows at underthehoodshow.com. Welcome back, everybody. It's time to get back under the hood with the Motor Medics. 866-594-4150. From the Autotempest.com studios, all the cars, one search. This is the Under the Hood Show. Let's talk to Brad. Brad, you're on the Under the Hood Show. What can we do for you? Hey, I got a question for you. I'm looking at a new uh, right-hand Jeep, and it's from... At Billions, they offer three different motors, a four-cylinder, a six-cylinder, and a diesel. What do you think would be best in South Dakota for longevity? Well, On a mail route. Billions, it's a right-hand Jeep. You're going to be using it on a mail route. I just think the, that's the Captain yep. Obvious, right? What if not? What if he just wants to feel yep. British? Yeah, there you go. Then, <laughs> then he should call in with a different accent. All right, good idea. I would eliminate the diesel. <laughs> Let's just take the diesel right out of the game. Off the top. I, I would agree for his use. Because of your use and what it's going to okay. cost you for maintenance and repairs when that thing breaks and knowing the history and thing, I'd just be like, no, just uh-uh. I've test driven both of those other motors. Now, is the is the four-cylinder, are you looking at, do they make that with the hybrid assist option on the four-cylinder? On the uh, right-hand he drive? He didn't say that. He said it, he said, he didn't say that. He just said it was a turbo. A four-cylinder turbo. Yeah, they. I, I'm just trying to remember what the option level is, but but they. We drove and test drove on a rental a um, Wrangler with the. Is this a this is a Wrangler or which one is it? Yep. Yep. Yeah, we drove one with that hybrid assist four-cylinder, and we were extremely impressed with how it drove, the power that it felt, really? and and just how it drove. In we were in town in. Uh, gosh, where were we at? We were in. I think we were in Phoenix, maybe, with our daughter. I, I just I can't remember where we were, but I, I was very impressed with how that drove. I said that th- twice now, sure. but I, I did a little bit of research on it, and there again on your on your route, depending on how long you're going to keep it. I don't think there'd be anything adverse with that. As a matter of fact, you might get a little better charging and recovery because of the starting and stopping that you're doing on the mail route. Uh, you know, the regenerative part sure. might be a little more helpful. I wouldn't be against it. But it does come at a higher price tag uh, quite a bit compared sure. to the standard V6. Uh, the V6 is a, sure. a motor they've had for a long time. I, I know they've made some advancements year over year on that. The earlier versions, my Jeep, I wasn't the only one, but I was one of just few, ended up having problems with the, with the valves in the head um, yep. and, and about 20,000 miles. And they were really good yep. about it, and they took care of it. And I think they knew that they had to... Get something going on that. I think they've got that pretty much taken care of. Now, me personally, because of all the starting and stopping, if it was city, if you were an Amazon package deliverer, you went house to house and you were a couple miles between, I'd probably go for the for a hybrid turbo four-cylinder. But because you're, you're on a mail route, as much as you're going to stop, the hybrid portion of the battery is going to be dead. I mean, it's going to be down so low that you're not going to gain a lot. I would go with the V6 because they they do have a good history. They had a few, like Shannon said, that had some issues, but they've I think they've overcome that. We haven't seen any in the in the newest ones lately, so I'd probably be going for the V6. Just you know, standard fuel injected, non turbo, tried and true, tough little V6. I think. Yeah, you might jump onto. I'm sure that yep. you guys probably got a mail carrier forum or something that's available and and uh, pose that yep. question and see what people have used and what their results have been. Of course, you're always going to have the the extreme side scaries that get on there and, you know, had the worst case experience right. ever in their life with any type of vehicle, but you can usually f- weed through all that and find out some good information. I, I, I can at least. Just take some levity to all the yep. comments. The, the only thing I remember the gentleman said from Billions that um, the four-cylinder turbo it's about 22, 23, most generally, on the mail routes that he has sold. And the six under, it's about 15. Now that's, so I don't know if that would mean it was a hybrid or not. I, I just, you know, I wish I just but, knew. I don't I don't know because I, I just, I didn't remember if they made a straight four-cylinder turbo option. I think they might, you know, and it's not a hybrid. I, I just, I just don't he, remember. And they keep, and they keep them on hand at Billions, he said. Yeah, they, that's a it's a snorty little engine and good fuel economy. Um, just 
One thing we always get a little more concerned about with uh, turbo smaller engines is just that you want to make sure that they, like anything, they can get used and get some RPMs you put into them and, and you know, get things warmed up sure. and, and just have some consistent use to them. But if they've got use experiences with people that have been buying them, um, there again, I, I'd want to talk to somebody so, that's had that for, right. for, and, 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 bought so, a sec- and bought a second one because they liked it. <laughs> so if, if it was... So Russ, if it was a non-hybrid straight four four cylinder turbo versus yeah. just a straight six cylinder, would I would be more apt. One versus yeah, I'd be okay with that, and I'd be more apt to purchase that. Now, just take how many gallons of fuel you you think you're going to use a year, which is going to be a lot on that Jeep. I was shocked when I looked at the number of gallons that my O3 Yukon had used on my old Bully Dog tuner over the years, and I went, "Whoa, that's thousands of gallons." And add another five miles. Look at your total gallons. Let's say it's five thousand gallons over a you know a period of a number of years. Add another five miles in there, and look at the cost difference there. That's going to be a lot overall. I mean, five miles a gallon is not a lot in some cases, depending on how many miles your car is getting per gallon. You know, fifteen to twenty. But overall, it's going to drastically add up. So it might be a lower cost of operation total. Well, well, in my Impala, it's one hundred and twenty gallons a week. Okay, so you're gonna be so, you're gonna be saving you know right to five miles per per gallon there you're gonna save a, a percentage. Also look at the cost of each oil change on the V6 basis uh, you know versus the four cylinder because the four cylinder might be a 100 percent synthetic change, where the V6 is a semi synthetic, and that could be a thirty to forty dollar difference in in price of changes in some cases. So you know, depending on the courts that it uses. So look at all those factors that a lot of people don't factor in. But what I'd I th- like to do is I like to look at the cost of that and then use whichever one makes most sense on the one I want. You know what I mean? <laughs> I go, I say to myself, well, it's going to cost more in gas, but I'm going to have fewer oil changes, so I should get that one. And the blue one's prettier. Yeah, yeah, it's probably, it's probably I should get that one. Brad, thanks very much for the call. 866-594-594. 4150. Let's talk to Virgil. You're on the Under the Hood Show. What can we do for you? Well, uh, I've got a situation. I've got a 2012 GMC pickup. and I bought it a couple of years ago from my brother's estate. And it uh, um, had 119,000 miles on it. I took it to my local GMC and had them change all the fluids and everything. And uh, this last week I was using it and... Uh, I noticed when I turn it to uh, auto four-wheel drive or full-time four-wheel drive, I got kind of a howl, a high-pitched hum or high uh, howl to it uh, when you accelerate. When it's on, you know, if I push down on the foot feet a little bit and stop accelerating, I got this whine. And I had a buddy with me, and we tried a number of different you know, scenarios just to see and when you turn it to full-time two-wheel drive, that goes away. Um, just wondering if you had any idea or what I should if you Have you had one of them? I got 100 and, 130 Hold on, I'm, miles on I'm going to stop now. you right there. We're, gonna ha- we're up against the hard break here. So we're going to, Virgil, you stay right where you are. We're going to put you on hold. We'll come right back to you and help you with this question. Unfortunately, that'll do it for this episode of the Under the Hood Show. That's going to do it. We have to end the show. This sh- The show. You know the show. The, the, Under show. the Hood show. I like that show. It's pretty good. This has been the Under the Hood Show. You can find us at underthehoodshow.com. The Under the Hood Show is brought to you by Sturdivants. All right. Now, when we come back, we're going to stay here, Virgil. You don't go anywhere. We're we're still on, but we're, we ran out of time. I That was my my mistake. We want to give them a good answer. All right. See you next week on the Under the Hood Show. All right, Virgil, we're back. Um, And we're back on the stream. So go ahead there. Okay. Have you had a truck yeah, before? Uh, have you had a truck before with this similar system ever in a in a Chevy GMC no. type truck? No. You, you have not. Okay. Cuz there are 
a little bit of inherent noise that comes from that front differential when you engage the four-wheel drive on those that you can definitely hear, depending on tires and the roads, when you engage four-wheel drive. Uh-huh. So our first thing we got to figure out is, uh-huh. is if this is an unusual whine or if it's just some of that resonant noise that comes from more things turning in that four-wheel drive system. Uh, you're, you, you said you had a friend with you. He, you guys were trying different things. Did you, did you both agree that this just didn't sound quite normal? Right. Yeah. Uh, on, you know, not normal. <laughs> right. And when you when you go and when you would go back and when you go back to two wheel drive, then it would go away. Yeah. I'm thinking you got a problem in the front differential. We've put a number of front differentials in those vehicles that the gearbox carrier up in the front end of that. When you put it in the auto position or in the four-wheel position, it locks that front differential carrier and it starts spinning and it's going to make noise. When you put it in the two-wheel drive position, it's going to stop. So it's, it's, it may not be the end of the world. And if you can put up with a little bit of noise, you may be able to drive it for thousands of miles yet because, you're, again, it's only doing it in auto and four high. But I would definitely have a mechanic listen to it to see how bad they think it is. Because we have many of our customers that are driving these around saying, yeah, I got 200000 on my truck. You know, I got 150. I don't want to spend $1,500, put a front end in it, or 2000 or 1000 whatever it may be. They're like, do I have to? It's like, no, it's not that bad. But if it gets worse than this, you need to get it in because it's going to have to be changed. But in a lot of cases, it's just a small whine. Now, they have a bad habit of leaking Oil, differential oil. Just a little bit. It's a little bit. But they only hold a little bit. So if they're getting low, it could cause this problem. So you want to make sure that it is full. And full doesn't mean all the way up to the bottom of the threads on the front end. It's usually about a half inch below because if it's completely full, it will always leak until it gets down to that level. So check that out. Make sure it's full. And... uh Go from there, I, w- I would say. Definitely have somebody listen to it that's in a professional shop. Yeah, okay. There you go, Virgil. Thanks Good very deal. much for the call. Yeah, because huh. that's got a independent front suspension on it, and mm-hmm. the side gears, for people that are still onto the stream, they're turning all the time with the front wheels. We had to call about this earlier. The axle shafts drive into the side, and they're always spinning. But then once you engage that four-wheel drive, you start getting the actuator locks in the gear, the side gears uh on the gear set and then the front drive shaft is putting power into it from the transfer case a turning tra- a tur- turning differential so all of a sudden you've got all these gears in motion instead of just the idling gears of the of the side of the carrier and that's when you start getting some more noises and different things going on were you specifically referring to the stream there because of your hand motions no is there more than normal oh yeah you just did the whole you were like well you said if you're still on the stream and you started I, that may this. have been completely self-conscious. There okay. was no intent, but I'm going to land an airplane now type yeah. of thing. Yeah, I think so. <clears throat> you did the whole interior of the... I don't normally do that, do I? This. No, I think you do. I just wonder no, why I don't. you referred to that, the stream. That, that just happened, and you called me out on it. No, no, you do that all the time. And if you're on the stream, please like and subscribe. Yeah. Do I appreciate do it, it when we're not in the after hours? Smash that yeah, like you, button. Make motions? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You When you talk about the transmission, and you'll talk about it turning and... I just wondered why you referred to the stream. That was the part that stood out, not the hand motions. Well, That's I knew we were normal. in the after hours portion of the show. Maybe I was bragging of, that we're on the after hours <laughs> portion of the show. You're just trying to sneak that in like a feature. Like hang in there. Not a bug. But hang yeah. in there. We're going to keep talking about stuff. Maybe. We got another call. Let's talk to Mark. Mark, you're on the Under the Hood show. What can we do for you? Uh, I am. Well, first of all, hello, Shannon, Russ, and whomever. <laughs> hey, uh, Mark. Hello, Mark, and whoever hey, uh, says hi, too. <laughs> Sorry, I don't listen much. That's all right. Uh, oh, phone's got off. Sorry. I know, you guys, uh, I know you guys have a lot of info, so I'm uh, working on a 2018 Silverado customer's vehicle. Uh, did an audio system uh, about nine months ago, uh, and he came back with an issue of his uh, instrument cluster not dimming with his dimmer switch. Uh so I'm looking at it, the the door switch is dim, the HVAC dims, the headlight switch dims, but the steering wheel and the cluster do not. And I'm wondering if you have any ideas. I checked all the audio connections. There's a Maestro piece, which does interact with the BCM. Uh, it doesn't seem like there's an issue with that. So I'm, I'm kind of at a loss here. Well, all of the 
dimming features of that vehicle are through data link. So they're mm-hmm. they're 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 not dimming through a hard wire. So I would suggest disconnect anything you have that is tied into the data link for testing purposes only. Disconnect that maestro piece from the data link connector. Uh, disconnect anything you've got for a bypass for a remote start and then clear the codes in the entire system and see if it operates or disconnect the battery for, you know, 15, 20 minutes, make sure it's got a good hard reset. Yeah. On this one. And then try it with those disconnected and see if it comes back at that point, it might be as simple as reconnecting those pieces that you've installed and it may just work mm-hmm. because, because it should. It's typically okay. not an issue. But on a few of these, we've seen anything aftermarket that ties into the data link connector interfere with just a few of the components. It could be just the, you know, you put a remote start in and just the radio doesn't dim now or just the cluster doesn't dim, uh, things like that. Mm-hmm. You know, um, some of the door switches and stuff right. like that are hardwired into the dimming system. Right where the cluster would not be. It would be separate. That would be on a data link, and the doors, they would be hardwired. So that could be why you're having the issue with the interference. It's not super common, but it can happen. It's no fun when you're the one having to try to fix it, though, is it? Right. And I did notice that the radio does also dim with the the dimmer switch. Um, And the reason I was so stumped is just because this Maestro piece – as far as I know, isn't meant to interact with the cluster. I mean, it does interact with some, some vehicle settings, which is obviously a data bus deal. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah, I just, uh, I thought, well, why, why would it, you know, interfere with the cluster? But yeah, I mean, it's kind of like a, just a case of an unrecognizable thing, maybe throwing, throwing it off or throwing something like into that, that in the stream. There's, you know, something's on the stream that shouldn't be. The radio is also hardwired. There's a, if you look at that, adapter that plugs in for the radio you'll see a, yeah, a dimmer wire and a, wire. Illum- yeah, and the, an illumination in there so that gives you the right. the hard function and that's why that would still work but when you get the ones that are can bus yeah you get a little bit of information there that's not right and it can it can screw up the when the addresses aren't right we have the same problem with cars you have one module that's going bad that's shorted and it can keep a car from running properly because it's it's interfering with the system. And I go and unplug it, take it out of there, and reset it, and it works fine. Plug that module in, and it's it's off again. It's goofy. Sure. Curiosity right. has the we'll best of me, those. Mark. What uh, what yeah. kind of audio system upgrades did you do to this truck? Just just because I like that uh, kind of stuff. <laughs> uh, well, and and you know we we talked to you quite a bit here. We're uh, I'm at Audio Playground, so. Um, but, uh, Penwood doubled in, uh, with a maestro, the customer brought in, uh, Hertz for the high end. Uh, there's a JL amp and two, I want to say JL tens or twelves in the factory JL CT boxes. That sounds pretty solid. It's, it's a decent sounding system. It's, you know, and it, it went together really nice. I mean, it looks great. It sounds great. Um, and I was a little disappointed when I saw it in the schedule the other day that, you know, he's having oh. issues. I was like, oh, man. He got I mean, those Hertz a, donut you know, speakers. <laughs> right. You know, and it's a, it's a, it's kind of a work truck. It's a fairly base single cab, long bed, but it's a nice truck. And uh, the customer's a really cool guy. And, you know, I definitely want to do what I can to, you know, solve the issues. So. Well, good luck on that one. Hopefully we gave you some ideas to think about and say hello to the rest of the crew down there. Mark, thanks very much for the call. Good luck. All right, there you go. That's uh, that's the end of it. That's the end of it. That's well, the end of the hood show. Probably best for me. I do have some other stuff to get to eventually. So, yeah. otherwise, I'd love to sit here and talk to everybody for hours and hours and hours. It is. It's my favorite day of the week, for mine, sure. Mine too. And if we had, if we, you know, if we had an, an, enough people doing it, if we had enough people on YouTube, we could oh. just sit here and do it all day. I do that. We only need about uh, one point two million more subscribers, and we could we could get this done. So tell your friends on YouTube. If everybody tells two friends, mm-hmm. and we'll, so on, we'll be close.